We'll now continue on with our discussion of Java threads. Here, we'll talk about how to run a Java thread, how to make it start to execute its unit of computation. We'll talk about some of the common methods that you find in threads that are important to know about. And I'll talk a little bit about something called the happens before ordering relationship, which is somewhat mysterious, but very important to understand how threads behave semantically. So let's first start by talking about running Java threads. So as I've alluded to a couple times before, there are multiple layers involved in creating and starting a thread. And uh, we'll talk more about these layers later in the course. Maybe we'll skip over that next and talk more about synchronizers, but we'll get to this eventually. So here are some of the layers. There's the OS kernel layer, system library layer, virtual machine or execution environment layer, threading and synchronization packages, and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different things that take place when a thread is created. When you simply say new thread object, that itself doesn't actually allocate a lot of resources. That just makes an object. And in particular, it does not allocate a stack of activation records. We'll talk more about what this call stack is in a second. It's not until you call the start method that the runtime stack is actually allocated. So just to see what's going on here visually, here's some component that's, say, running on the main thread for the sake of argument. That's got a runtime stack. In there, there's some code that makes a new thread object. So we say new thread of some kind. And it's only when we call start that the stack is created and the run method will begin to execute. So after start is called, run is executed. And that'll actually be important when we talk about what happens before. The Java execution environment, which might be the virtual machine, might be the Android uh, art environment, whatever, or Dalvik, that's what's going to be used to call the runhook method after start creates the resources that the thread needs to begin to do its work. So it's the environment that's responsible for making this happen. And then after that, each thread can run concurrently and block independently. So that's kind of the whole purpose of getting these threads up and running, is you want them to be able to do things that don't interfere with each other. If you didn't have that issue, then, of course, all you'd have to do is just have one thread. But as we talked about in a class or two before this, if you only have one thread of control, certain things get complicated. And trying to implement complex systems with long-running operations, like downloading images or whatnot, in a single thread of control is very, very tedious and error-prone and inefficient to do. In general, any code can run in a thread. So we've got a thread method, and you put the code that you want to run there. So, so in theory, especially in sort of uh, server-style applications or command line applications, you can run pretty much anything in a thread. In windowing environments, you often are restricted as to which thread can access certain user interface components. So there's restrictions in Android, for example, about whether anything other than the user interface thread can access the GUI toolkit components, menus and dialogues and other, other ways of interacting with the user. And we'll talk more about those, but in a nutshell, it's because the, of the things we talked about before, right? We want to, Android didn't, the Google didn't want app developers to have to know that much about concurrency if they didn't need to, and they wanted to keep the toolkit the GUI toolkit implementation lightweight and free of locks. So as a result, only the UI thread can access GUI components in Android. And you can read about that here. It talks about some of the patterns for dealing with that. We'll talk a lot more about that later, of course. Once run starts, then the program keeps running until run returns. And I, I call this thing a hook method. I'll talk more about what a hook method is in a second. So run is a hook method. It's a place in the threading framework that provides an opportunity for you, the application developer, to customize the behavior of the program. The underlying thread scheduler, which is probably some combination of the operating system scheduler for threads and maybe the virtual machine, depending on how it's implemented, those things collaborate in order to suspend and resume the thread many times during its life cycle. And they typically use some kind of round robin model where each thread gets to run for a certain quantum, and after that quantum is finished, then the thread scheduler will come in, suspend the existing thread, and then pick another thread that's waiting patiently in its queue of threads, and let that thread start to run. And that gets to run for a while. And it typically gets to run for things like you know 50 milliseconds or whatever, 10 milliseconds. There's, there's different rates at which threads get switched back and forth. 
These scheduling operations are largely transparent to user code, to your code that you write, as long as you perform synchronization properly, as long as you put locks around your code in the right way. And we'll talk more about that when we get into synchronization in more detail. If you want a thread to run forever, then you simply need to have the run hook method go in an infinite loop, right? So you have a run method, you say while true, and then it'll just run forever until you get sick and tired of it and you'll shut the program down or something like that. So that's how you can have things just keep executing. When run returns, the thread is considered to no longer be alive, it's considered to be dead, and at that point, certain things will happen. Uh, a thread can end normally, right? It may just fall off the end at some point, right? If you return or you fall off the end. So that's one way a thread can end. A thread can also end if an exception is thrown that is not caught in the body of the run method. So if you have an uncaught exception, that will also trigger the thread to exit. Uh, now, it's usually a pretty darn good idea to make sure that you have an uncaught exception handler registered with each thread to print some kind of message, you know, some kind of final request, last will and testament, you know, goodbye cruel world before it stops. Otherwise, you can often have weird bugs in your program where things stop working and you can't figure out why. So that's why I have your program set the uncaught exception handler. The join method is a method that allows one thread to wait for another thread to complete. So it's used as a very simple form of barrier synchronization, which I'll talk about in a second. I first saw this quote when I was an undergrad many, many, many years ago. I always thought it was pretty funny. It says, I'll be right back, Godot. Right, so if you ever read the classic, I think it's, what is it, Samuel Beckett book, what play, Waiting for Godot, right? The people spend their whole time waiting for Godot. And Godot leaves the message, I'll be right back, right? He never shows up. So that's what join is used to do. It's a simple form of barrier synchronization, and we'll talk a lot more about that later. Likewise, a thread can simply evaporate when it's finished. If the thread is done and nobody wants to wait for it, when it finishes, the resources are reclaimed, and it's up to the Java execution environment to get those resources back. And what that typically means will happen will be that the operating system will reclaim the, the runtime stack, and the Java virtual machine will reclaim any other Java-centric resources that were allocated while the thread was running, and while it was, uh, when it was created and while it's running. Some examples of things that get reclaimed would, as it, just what I mentioned, the runtime stack, thread-specific storage, other memory that may have been allocated. There's a bunch of common thread, method, uh, thread methods that the Java thread class defines. We'll talk about some of them. Uh, one is called a daemon thread, which is kind of weird. This means that the thread will uh, continue to run in the background. So it'll, it'll basically has a background status. And there's certain properties of daemon threads and how they, they run and how they uh, cause the program to shut down or not when the program's finished. Start allocates the thread resources and makes it start to run by running the hook method. Run is a hook method. I keep using that term. What the heck does that mean? It's basically a method where user code is supplied. You can take a look at this link for more about what a hook method is. Hook methods are very commonly used in object-oriented frameworks where the framework developers can provide a lot of the structure and functionality off the shelf for you, right? Like, you don't have to write 99% of what it takes to make a thread. But there are some places where the framework developer is not omniscient, so they require interaction with the programmer or the application to do the right thing. So a hook method is simply a hook that the framework calls out to when it no longer can do things in a generic way. So obviously, the the thread framework knows how to make a thread, it knows how to allocate the resources, create the runtime stack, but eventually it gets to a point where it's like, okay, everything's ready to go. What do you want me to do, boss? And so the run method is, the hook method is where you provide that code. Join is simply a way to wait for a thread to finish. It waits for a single thread to finish. And uh, you can see you can do time joins as well as blocking joins. Sleep is a way to have a thread wait for a certain amount of time. You can find out what the current thread is. This gives you back an object for the current thread. Very important uh, method to understand if you are a grad student implementing the reentrant spin lock class for assignment 1B. You'll have to know how to call a current thread in order to get the object for the current thread. 
There's a bunch of methods for interrupting a thread to tell a thread, hey, when you have a chance, why don't you shut yourself down? And we'll talk more about that later. You can check to see if you've been interrupted. There's a couple of variants there. And this one called is interrupted can be called multiple times without affecting something called the interrupted status, which we'll talk about later. And then there's another method called interrupted, which tests whether the current thread has been interrupted. And that clears the interrupted status the first time it's called. These two methods are uh, confusingly, their semantics are confusing, and so we will talk about them in more detail later. There's also a couple of methods to set and get the priorities of a thread, which is used to influence the thread scheduler to decide when to run the threads and when not to, uh, and how to prioritize them if there's multiple threads to run. All right, the last topic here is the happens before topic, which deals with ordering in which memory is moved around and, and things are, are seen to occur after something else has occurred. So uh, it's a very, it's not really that complicated of a concept, but it's subtle. And so I recommend if you really want to understand it, take a look at the Wikipedia link on happened before. And we'll talk about sort of ways in which this works. So the idea here in a nutshell is that if you have a thread that does some things, then uh, there's certain semantics of stuff, for example, like locking and unlocking uh, in, intrinsic locks or, or uh, mutexes and so on. And when you do these things, then you can have a happens before relationship with other threads. And so this basically means the following. If, if uh, what happens before does is it ensures if one event happens before another event, the results must reflect that happens before relationship, even if the events are actually executed out of order. Very weird concept. And it really has to do with trying to cache information to speed things up while still preserving appropriate ordering semantics that are important to program correctness. So the main reason for doing all this stuff is to be able to optimize the programs for concurrency in order to be able to take advantage of all the hardware uh, acceleration that's available on modern processors, which have what are called weakly ordered memory models. So basically, the way it works, whoops, what the heck happened there? <laughs> that was weird. OK. It's like aliens were communicating through the uh, screen. Um, in general, a happens before relationship guarantees that memory written to by statement A, let's say this is statement A, will be visible to statement B. So we have thread 1. We come along. It sets answer to some value. And then it sets ready to true. And assuming that we are using synchronizers properly here, then if thread two comes along and it finds that ready is true, we want the answer to be 42, not some other random number. And if we didn't have the happens before relationship enforced, it could very well be the case that even though ready is set to true after answer, if we didn't have the happens before relationship properly enforced, that ready would be true but answer might be some other random value besides 42. And so the happens before relationship makes sure that both these things happen in the right order so that this code makes sense. So let's give some examples. This will hopefully make it a little bit more clear. It's, it's a rather abstruse topic if you just talk about it in terms of abstract memory model orderings. You could read more about this stuff here under Java memory model. So here's some obvious things. If you think about it, it's got to be this way, right? You want to make sure that the thread has been started and is all ready to go before the run hook method is actually called, right? Because it wouldn't do any good to say, you know, new thread, start, and then before the runtime stack and all the registers are allocated, the run method starts to run. Man, oh man, would that make a mess, right? Um, so here. This lambda expression plays the role of the run hook method. When start is called, the thread will be completely finished being initialized before the lambda expression is actually called back here to run the computation in the thread. So the thread state is consistent and visible before run starts. Pretty important to have that happens before relationship. The Java util concurrent package, which is where most of the interesting stuff we're going to play around with this in this course resides has a whole bunch of happens before relationships. So here's one. 
if you have a concurrent hash map, you'll learn more about concurrent hash map as we go through the course. If you have concurrent hash map, then when you put and get items into and out of, you know, put items into the hash map, take items out of the hash map in different threads of control, then there's a happens uh, before relationship to ensure that the contents of the key and value pair are put into the collection and properly made visible to other threads before another thread can actually get that value for that key. If you didn't have a happens before relationship, the key might be updated with a different old value. And if you didn't have the happens before relationship, you'd get an old value for that key. So happens before means that the key and value are both stored in the collection, made visible to other threads, such that when you do a get on that key, you get the right value. Amanda. When, when start finishes and the memory model has properly been synchronized to make sure everything is consistent and visible, then run is called. And, and we'll see, we'll talk a bit more about this in, in detail later. This has to do with things called barriers and fences, um, memory fences. The termination of a thread happens before join with the terminated thread. So if I go here and I make myself a new thread and I start it, then this operation has got to be finished in any state that it affects has got to be flushed properly out to all the other caches before join returns. So you don't join while this thread is still in the process of shutting itself down. Now, again, you'd get inconsistent results. You'd get bizarre half results or you know, results that would be different each time you ran the program because the ordering might be different depending on the phase of the moon or the number of gamma rays striking the processor or whatnot. So they, they have these memory fences to push the information out to make sure all the caches are consistent. The Java thread and library classes are responsible for making sure all this stuff works as, as defined by the semantics of the Java memory model. Fortunately, you don't have to understand the nitty gritty details of the memory model. You just have to understand how to use synchronizers properly. And that's gonna be one of the themes we're gonna keep coming back to as we go through the myriad Java synchronizers, starting with spin locks, which you're going to do for your assignment, but also involving mutexes and semaphores and uh, condition objects and all this other good stuff, con concurrent hash maps. All of these things will end up doing a lot of this stuff for you. You just have to make sure that the data that you write in your code is properly protected by using these locks. And it turns out that there's a lot of easy ways to do this using various patterns, like the monitor object pattern and so on. That's one way to make life easy. The other way to make life easy is to switch over and use the Java 8 synchronization, or sorry, the Java 8 parallel processing mechanisms like completable futures and parallel streams, which often make the problem just disappear because of the way they partition the data sources up into chunks that have no dependencies. But you can't always get away with that, especially for things like the Palantiri Manager, which is inherently meant to share resources between threads, right? So we've got to have a way to know how synchronization works. Okay, that's the end of part two.